Um, hello, everybody. Welcome again to a joint session with uh, Orthopedic uh, UK and FRCS Mentor Group. As always, we are very uh, grateful that you're joining us. Um, today, we are very lucky to have both uh, Prof Cost, uh, Kosker and uh, Mr. Duncan Whitwell from Nuffield Orthopedic Centre. Um, in terms, uh, I'll introduce Mr. Whitwell in a moment, but just a reminder to everybody, we are, uh, OR UK is running a Tuesday foot and ankle viva session on Tuesday the 20th of October. The FRCS uh, mentor group is also running a viva webinar sessions on the 10th of October, 24th of October and 21st of November. Um, please do visit the relevant websites um, and you can register through there. And of course, uh, we are recording this uh, session today with Mr. Whitwell and will be on the YouTube channel, uh, FRCS Mentor channel for and ORUK website for, for your review later on. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions and there will also be an MCQ uh, during this, but today we won't be doing a viable session um, for obvious reasons as we're doing two sessions this week uh, in terms of lectures. Um, is once again, uh, everybody welcome. And I'd like to just uh, say it's a real pleasure to have both uh, Mr. Whitwell and uh, Prof. Kosker with us today. Mr. Whitwell is a full-time NHS consultant uh, specializing in the treatment of orthopedic and oncology disorders and complex hip and knee reconstructive arthroplasty. He's an honorary senior lecturer at Oxford uh, University and holds a consultant post at Nuffield Orthopedic Center. Uh, uh, and has a private uh, practice at the Manor Hospital in Oxford. He has been chair of the Oxford Sarcoma Network and regularly lectures at invited meetings. He has a strong clinical research interest in uh, hip and pelvic oncology and has been awarded uh, the prestigious ABC Travelling Fellow uh, to, Can uh, to Canada and the US in the British Orthopaedic Association 2012. And speaking personally, I am in awe of both Prof. Kosker and Mr. Whitwell. Um, very it's great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's called a false start. So yeah, I'll go back to the starting line and uh, we'll start. Thanks very much. Great pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, we really value education as orthopedic oncologists because regrettably, we do see examples where sarcoma maybe hasn't been treated appropriately. And it's largely because it's such a rare cancer. It's a complicated cancer as well with over 70 different histological subtypes. We span this benign malignant spectrum, which I'll try and explain to you, but it only makes up 1% of all cancers. And so it's not probably at the front of our brain. Maybe we're on a busy on call night and we see someone who may or may not have a pathological fracture. Are we thinking that it could be a chondrosarcoma? We don't want to take that to theatre and nail. We want to work it up. And my colleague, Tom Koska, will be talking very much about the, the workup of these cases tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna just concentrate on this range of bone tumors from the benign to malignant spectrum. They have a number of different treatment algorithms. Most involve surgery and another have various degrees of um, effectiveness with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I think the great thing about sarcoma is that it occurs around the body and so we have mainly hip and knee surgeons who do sarcoma but we often need to bring in other specialists from other areas and uh, it was great when we appointed Tom Koska as one of our colleagues at to Oxford because he'd done a shoulder fellowship so we could get him really concentrating on upper limb sarcomas and I work quite regularly with other surgeons in the bowel, the chest etc in trying to deal with these uh, difficult cases. Just for some facts, we um, see approximately um, 100 bone tumours a year in Oxford and about two to 300 soft tissue sarcomas. We, it's a normal that rate, that, 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 um, the, 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 the numbers you see is five to one soft tissues to bone. And Lovely, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. So yeah, so that's, so, so um, we're here now just talking about the fact that that's a soft tissue sarcoma. And the normal sort of um, yeah, um, relationship between bone and soft tissue is five to one. And there's about 1,500 soft tissue sarcomas in the wells per year and about 350 bone tumors. This is a soft tissue sarcoma here. And this is a, a quite a classic site for a, a bone tumor. Um, and I normally sort of uh, yeah, ask the question what this is. And most people come up the exam, no, this is a parosteal osteosarcoma, quite a unique site. Um, for that type of tumour and uh, is uh, 
is known by the examiners. So you might see that. The other thing about sort of sarcomas, I said they occur all around the body, but most of them tend to occur in the lower limb, 10% around the pelvic girdle, 40%, 6% in the lower limb. Um, we do see um, intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic, and the odd head and neck, and about 13% are in the upper limb as well. So yeah, this is where we have to get that site-specific expertise sometimes to help us um, deal with these cases. And really this is what I just want to sort of highlight why education is so important, is to try and yeah, think always about the potential for not just sarcoma, but maybe even metastatic disease. And um, when you're seeing sort of unusual presentations of fractures, and if it doesn't quite seem right, just take your time and you hopefully your radar will get especially attuned as you get more experience to knowing when things is not right. Take your time. You don't need to rush them to theatre, um, despite maybe the, the, the pressure on um, getting patients um, yeah, on, on, on pathways. Try and make a diagnosis um, if you've got anything unusual. So this is a case that really drove this home to me right at the start of my consultant career. Um, in the first year of practice, I got referred this 32 year old male, fit and active, who'd been kite surfing in Turkey. He'd fractured his femur and had it nailed and then was flown back. Three months later, the fracture was not healing. And I think you can see that there is a lytic deposit and it really wasn't really noticed even at this stage three months later because the patient went for exchange nailing and at exchange nailing um, they found, so I'm just trying to make sure I can get, I'll, I'll, I'll probably click on there. And at, um, and at exchange nailing they found renal cell carcinoma and they also found staph epidermidis, um, unfortunately. So we've got this situation where that was a nailing of a, metast of a metastasis. He also had a, uh, they found of the primary in one of the kidneys. What do you do? And yeah, ideally we should have, before this nailing was put in, we, that should have been, and in fact should have been noted, you can see there's definitely lysis at the bone end and that patient needs to be properly worked up. Now metastasis are important. We do see them quite regularly. They're probably, they're much more common than actually sarcoma. And these are just some ribbons that people wear to represent the various cancers on fundraising days throughout the year. These are the major metastatic deposits in the bone. So these are the major osteophiles. And I just want to mention metastatic disease first because it is so common and it's increasingly becoming um, more common as we as with as the treatments the oncologists give to patients get better. There's breast, prostate, lung, renal, thyroid, GA. They're the ones that spread to bone. There's actually a difference between a number of these. There's the cancers that really at the moment don't have a lot of, of uh, oncological treatments and their survival can be measured as you see here in months, the lung and the colorectal. And then there's the cancers that actually the survival now is in years, breast, prostate, kidney and thyroid. Many years in fact and I've just seen a patient who had kidney cancer 15 years ago who's still alive. Um, and if you look at here about the chance of these fractures healing you can see that on the whole if you have a fracture from these metastases they're not likely to heal. Prostate might but on the whole the rest of them might not. So that's important when you are faced with patients with pathological fractures or pathological lesions. So you don't want to miss it because it can cause problems. And the other thing is mistaking a primary bone tumor for a secondary. Just assuming an elderly patient has got a metastasis, if they haven't got any previous history of a primary is wrong. Any solitary lesion in bone is a primary malignant bone tumor until proven otherwise. The other problems that we see in metastatic disease is you underestimate patient survival. As I said, you don't realize that some kidney, um, that some patients, particularly with kidney cancer, can live 10, 15 years now. And so you've got to do the right operation for them. 
And uh, the other thing is to overestimate the fact that you just nail and you think that radiotherapy is going to kill that cancer and cause bone healing. It won't. Fractures do not heal. And I just want to emphasize some of the problems we see. This was a beautifully plated distal femoral fracture undertaken in Marseille, I think. The, they had a lot of time filling the screw holes here, and I'm sure the trauma surgeons amongst you would be a little bit critical of the stiffness of this construct. But anyway, at this stage, despite this being a low energy injury sustained playing tennis, there was no concern about this fracture. And then unfortunately, three months later, the plate broke because the fracture wasn't healing. And only at this stage did they diagnose in the fracture that there was a renal cell metastasis. A nailing was then undertaken, but really we're not addressing the issue that renal cell has got a long survival, that it will very rarely heal this fracture, and yet we're asking metal to splint this and aim for healing, despite um, maybe some radiotherapy. And so you can imagine what happened, like sometimes it happens in my operating theatre with some of the instruments that I use, they get metal fatigue and they fracture. And the fact that a lot of these cancers are very radio insensitive, they really don't respond to radiation, whereas breast prostate partially does. What we find is that this happened, the nail and the screws um, failed. What do you do to this patient who's got solitary renal cancer here and you potentially could live many years well you can't keep doing intralesional surgery in this case you have to go for an on-block resection and bring in a tumor type prosthesis and this patient actually did very well and was walking out of hospital within three days after having what should have been the definitive operation in the first place so what do you do with this patient with renal cancer and staph aureus? This is this kite surfer. He only had a kidney cancer. There was no other disease. This is solitary disease, our metastatic disease. You've got to be quite aggressive. And this is the patient who now is 15 years after presenting that I still see in my clinic. We were very radical. We did a total femoral section keeping a big soft tissue cuff around the fracture site to make sure we got all the kidney cancer out. We gave him a spacer for six weeks, gave him some antibiotics, and then that's a spacer. We make it out of a long nail, an old nail that we cover in antibiotic impregnated cement. So there's lots of antibiotic elution into the soft tissues as well as IV therapy and you just jam it into the tibia, you give them a cricket bad splint and they can mobilize. It's actually a reasonably comfortable construct. And then I gave them a total femoral replacement. Really sort of, um, sort of summarizes where I think metastatic is so important because it is a bone tumor. And I think that it is largely poorly served, but you for the exam may well get this case. An 80 year old male, he's fallen out of bed, He's got a classic intertrochanteric neck of femur, or maybe even a subtrochanteric neck of femur fracture. You've got the scenario that you want to take him to theatre, or the anaesthetist wants to get him to theatre quickly because the targets are important and they've got to get them done early. What do you do? You've got to be a little bit concerned, haven't you? Just looking at the matrix here, that there's something going on. You're going to be concerned that maybe the patient when you from your history has had some pain previously in the run up to this fall. And so this patient is to be stopped. It's not to go to theater. You're gonna work it up. You're gonna work it up with what Tom's gonna to describe tomorrow. You're gonna to get an MRI scan. You're gonna maybe get a chest CT abdomen. You're gonna try and see what this is. Could this could be a metastatic deposit or as a solitary lesion with this patient having no known history of cancer could be a priming malignant bone tumor and so this is really where in the exam they're trying to make sure that you as the consultant on call are safe and that you're going to be sort of um yeah really just sort of um yeah cognizant that there could be other pathologies going on and not letting this go to theater um like uh, like you could do and the answer is this was a clear cell chondrosarcoma luckily it was biopsied we were then able to take the patient 
after the biopsy and do this type of operation rather than a neck of femur Austin Moore that would contaminate the area even further and probably would might even necessitate us doing a, um, a through hip amputation. So that's what we want you to be sort of thinking about when metastatic disease is a much more common presentation than sarcoma. So this is just uh, in summary of my metastatic talk is don't do this guys, don't refer to pathologists, refer to your local sarcoma or oncology unit for advice or send the patients there if you've got any concerns. So I want you to get an idea on sarcomas, which is quite a big subject that you can actually break it down quite nicely into various different categories. I've already sort of told you that there's bone and soft tissue sarcomas, ratio of, of, uh, of, what, of five to one, but also sarcomas are named because they come from tissue of, mesoder of mesenchymal origin. They come from mesoderm tissue. And that's cartilage, bone, muscle, fat, smooth muscle. And so all these have slightly different um, types of tumours. As you know, the Latin um, moniker is given to these, the chondro, the osteo, the rhabdo, lipo and leomyo. I'm sure you can sort of really know those. And there's this benign malignant spectrum. And I want you to understand there's a bit of a, a structure you can do. And then your further reading will allow you to sort of build up some of the more detail about them. So there's benign and malignant. The benign tumours tend to be classified into three types of aggressiveness. There's latent, like a non-ossifying fibroma. There's an active, a bit like maybe an enchondroma, maybe aggressive, like a giant cell tumour. Break them down into these major um, tissue types, bone, cartilage, fibrous, then unfortunately, because we're not all nice and simple in sarcoma, I've got a fourth group miscellaneous. And that group, I'm largely gonna talk about the cysts. Malignant, your aggressiveness is low, intermediate, high grade. And again, you can break them down into these four major categories, bone, cartilage, and fibrous tissue, and then a miscellaneous, in that miscellaneous, I tend to put Ewing's or round cell tumours because they don't fit really anywhere else. So apart from the miscellaneous category, which is um, a little bit um, messy, everything else I'm going to talk to you fits nicely into these categories. So you can look at these any the x-rays and think, is it a bone, cartilage or a fibrous tumour? I've quickly talked about metastasis. That's probably a subject all on its own. We could have another seminar at some point on that. And occasionally you do get hematological malignancies as well. Again, we don't have the time really on that. So I'm just gonna concentrate on this spectrum of benign to malignant in these categories, bone, cartilage, fibrous, and miscellaneous. So you can see that in bone, when the matrix is mainly bone forming, the benigns are these tumours moving up to the malignant, the, ose the osteosarcoma. And I'll talk about the periosteal ones, the surface ones, as well as the more classic central um, osteosarcoma. In cartilage, you, these are the benign tumours you should know a little bit about, moving over to the chondrosarcoma. And there's a few different types of chondrosarcoma I'll touch on as well. Fibrous, again, these are the benign um, fibrous tumours moving on to the slightly more aggressive malignant version, fibrous sarcoma, adamantinoma, MFH, which actually has changed its name now to the pleomorphic spindle cell sarcoma, and uh, I'll touch on that later. And then the cysts, you do see a number of these cysts, so I think I do need to talk about them, the giant cell tumour, the ABC unicameral and then the miscellaneous and malignancy is just about the Ewings, which we'll touch on at the end. So I really think if you get that sort of structure, thinking about whether that's bone, cartilage or whatever, and to get an idea whether it's benign or malignant, that will help you try and work out what the tumour potentially could be. So the examiners love their x-rays on their computer. You'll sit at the desk, the examiner will turn the computer around to you and you'll have an x-ray on the screen. They won't want you to touch it, they want you to get your pen out to sort of um, just touch around what the important features. 
So this is what the vibers do. They get you talking and describing x-rays. First thing is to talk about, yeah, where, just if you want to have some thinking time. So you can just start off just saying what the x-ray shows, or what the x-ray is, is that's a, obviously a knee AP x-ray. And this is a CT scan. And then you can talk a little bit about where there's maybe a lesion. Think about the epiphysis. Think about the metaphysis or the diaphysis. The reason I say that is that the nice thing about sarcomas, even though it's very complex with seven different types of, of subtypes, what you find is that there's only a very few that like the epiphysis, a few more like the metaphysis, and then just a few like the diaphysis, like adamantinoma and Ewing's. So this is a really good diagram to commit to memory because it just allows you to see where the lesion is and it can hopefully trigger whether it's um, yeah, one of these types of tumours. It's a, an, a, an ability to help. Also the age, you can see whether there's still growth plates. So you can get an idea whether it's maybe a paediatric problem. And paediatrics would tend to be thinking about Ewing's and osteosarcoma. Where it's the, pla the, the, the growth plates are fully formed, it's going to be a, of adult age, and then they may be sort of um, some of the other tumours. So you've got, you can do this sort of um, description of the x-ray while you're actually thinking about what it could be. And then do you think it's a bone matrix, a cartilage matrix, or is it maybe a fibrous matrix? What's the lesion doing to the bone? Is it eroding it? Or is it just sitting there nicely corticated? And is there a soft tissue mass? Try and get in the habit of describing x-rays in this sort of sequence. So going back to this x-ray, this is an epiphyseal tumour. So already after describing it, you'll, you'll know there aren't many epiphyseal tumours. So you'll hopefully come up with eventually a maybe a chondroblastoma. But as sarcoma surgeons, it's never always quite so nice. So you've always got to just be careful and say, even though I think it's maybe a chondroblastoma, we'll always be getting a tissue diagnosis. And that's important because very occasionally you can get, unfortunately, a clear cell chondrosarcoma in the epiphysis that you never want to be caught out on. So there's always a little bit of muddying rather than the rules. This is an apophysis. This is a greater trochanter. This is an epiphyseal equivalent. So this is, again, a chondroblastoma. You can see there's a little bit of spickling as though it's a cartilage matrix. It's a relatively walled off tumour. So you don't think that, that that is that aggressive. So that a chondroblastoma, which is a benign aggressive tumour, fits in quite nicely. So really thought, think about that, that um, diagram. Think about what part of the bone the tumours are in. And it can often give you a good help to come up with a meaningful differential diagnosis. And you can see on the MRI scan, there was a uh, cartilage matrix. So this X-ray, you can say you can describe this a little bit further. It's a metaphyseal, epiphyseal um, lesion. It's quite permeate, permeative. Um, there's uh, cortical destruction. Yeah, you don't know where the tumour finishes, really, do you? It's all like spreading through quite a lot of the bones. So this has definitely got an aggressive air to it. And this actually was a lymphoma which was destroying the proximal femur. So those sort of um, few phrases that you can use to describe it are useful for you to come up with a differential. And I would say that you can often use differential tumours such as, um, different, in your differential diagnosis tumours such as um, fibrous dysplasia. And you can always often say this could be infection as well. Infection's a big tumour mimic and that can often be brought into your diagnosis. So you can see that it's quite disruptive there and that was lymphoma. So, and here now you can see, what's this matrix? You can see it's probably bone forming. And you can see there's probably some bone out in the soft tissues here. There's uh, some little bit of uh, yeah, Cobman's triangle there with the periosteums raised up. It's a mixed lytic picture here. So that's, and it's also eccentric in the metaphysis. So that's hopefully triggering you to come up that this could well be an osteosarcoma and it, that's what it was. So yeah unfortunately I can't sort of um, get you talking but normally in my talks I get the delegates to describe these because it just get people sort of coming up with the vocabulary 
to describe these x-rays. And then you've got here, that's quite a nice, you can see that we can definitely know where the tumour is. There's not a, a, a nice thin geographic zone around it. And that could either be fibrous dysplasia or a unicameral bone cyst. Um, maybe infection could be brought in in the differential if you, uh, if you if, as well. This is an expansile lesion, distal radius, and it's a metaphysis seal tumour going into the epiphysis. And we'll see that later in the talk is a giant cell tumour. And these are the sun ray spicules you see in aggressive. Um, and this is actually more in the diaphysis than the epiphysis, than the metaphysis. And this actually in a paediatric patient is a Ewing sarcoma. So let's just carry on straight on to just go through some of the, the routine tumours, which are the benign bone tumours. This is a patient who um, had pain um, at night, seemed to be relieved by aspirin. You can see something here in the neck and you can see this on the CT scan. So this is a, a classic history for an osteoid osteoma, which is an osteoblastic tumour. There's a few sort of details here, which yeah, you can get from all the textbooks. A lot of these tumours like the younger patient. Most of them tend to have a male predisposition. And as you know, the classic history for osteoarthritis is night pain, relieved by aspirin and non-steroidals. It can occur in the, in the back and cause a scoliosis. It can occur near the knee joint, the hip joint, and sometimes cause a joint effusion as well. The treatment is with radiofrequency ablation or potentially curatage. Um, a CT scan often nicely shows that there's a lesion in the bone and it's never really bigger than a centimetre. And uh, you occasionally on block excise them, but we largely just put a probe in under CT control. That probe heats up to about 90 degrees for about 10 minutes. That completely um, heats up the tumour. Um, and, uh, and that often causes resolution and bone infilling. So that's the osteodosteoma, really the start of this spectrum of bone tumours from benign to malignant. This is the bigger brother of the osteodosteoma. This is um, again a lesion in here, in, it's in the, um, um, the metaphysis. It's a little bit bigger, it's bigger than a centimetre. And actually it can be a little bit more aggressive than osteodosteoma. And this is called an osteoblastoma. Again, you can see a little less common than osteoblastoma. Same sort of demographics. Again, still likes going into the spine and uh, seen in the posterior elements in about 30% of cases. Again, very similar investigations, MRI and thin section CT scan is often hot on bone scan. And it can be mixed up with ABCs, giant cell tumours, even chondroblastomas sometimes. And you would tend to want to treat these with on-block excisions or curatage and bone graft. And you'll see whenever we do curatage these lesions, these benign lesions, we always tend to unfortunately claim about 10 to 20% recurrence rate. So you can always say that in the exam, that seems to be uniform amongst any tumour that we curatage. Just be always a bit careful though, even though it looks benign, you can get an osteosarcoma called a ten telinjectatic osteosarcoma, which I'll show you later, which unfortunately is a very lytic lesion. And so you can, you've always got to make sure that you never really diagnose an osteoblastoma until you've got a tissue diagnosis, because you don't want to miss a telinjectatic osteosarcoma. Then we're moving on to the cartilage benign tumours. We've got something called an osteochondroma, which is that um, a disorder of the growth plate, where rather than the growth plate um, expanding horizontally, cartilage gets chewed out laterally. And uh, so that's how you tend to get osteochondromas from childhood. Again, very similar demographics that we've seen before. Two types really of osteochondromas. They can be the sessile flat type or the exostosis stalk like, often asymptomatic, but can cause some mechanical symptoms on adjacent tendons and ligaments, can be painful if they're not. You really only treat these though if they're symptomatic. However, if 
after maturity, after you've got skeletal maturity, you're getting increasing growth in one of these osteochondromas, that is worrying. And that does increase the risk of it becoming a malignant chondrosarcoma. Also, if there's a cartilage cap bigger than two centimeters, that would worry us for it changing to a chondrosarcoma and they're the indications for treatment. So we see them around the knee, shoulder and hip. I'm often the bone scan is relatively cool. But yeah, this is a sessile osteochondroma between the tibia and the fibula. You can see how long standing it's been there with that long standing erosion of the adjacent fibula. So if you just saw that x-ray, you could be a little bit worried there's maybe a, a bone tumor and another type of bone tumor there. But that long standing change in the fibula should reassure you. That's actually what on cross sectional imaging you saw on the osteochondroma and that cartilage cap is bigger than two centimeters. So that would worry us that there may be within this cartilage cap, there is some malignant transformation into a low grade chondrosarcoma. So you're gonna get pictures like this and the examiner's gonna say, what is this? And you know that you've got osteochondromas here, but you've got multiple, maybe causing sort of um, 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 growth abnormalities. And so you've got a condition of multiple exostosis, multiple osteochondromas, and it's called HME, hereditary multiple exostosis, or previously known as diaphyseal ecclesia. It's an autosomal dominant condition, variable degrees of penetrance, number of clinical manifestations, very occasionally malignancy, just because you have so many osteochondromas, they, add, they recommend about, uh, they have a very small chance of malignancy in each one, so, so you do have to be a bit careful. And the books check and vary on what they say is a risk of malignancy. I've seen some textbooks talk about 1% risk of malignancy, well, I've always known it about 0.2% in every osteochondroma. So if you've got maybe 100 or so, that might be significant. But we're much more keen on these patients just reporting um, increased growth after skeletal maturity or increased symptoms like pain, and then we'll treat them. We don't routinely follow these patients up. So HME is an important one. Then you've got cartilage tumours within the bone. And these are called enchondromas. And these are very common. And they often do sometimes cause um, some diagnostic difficulty when they're seen um, in, in, in other otherwise age patients who are asymptomatic because of adjacent um, yeah, um, joint problems. So we get a lot of cases just sent up for our knee surgeons who've just done knee x-rays and they see these uh, cartilage tumors above them. Benign cartilage tumour is quite common, again, relatively affected in young people, mainly in the long bones, so we do see them in the hands. And just to sort of show, these are how these cartilage tumours are formed. These are just being chewed out from the growth plate, become exostoses or osteochondromas, or they remain as remnants of the osteogenesis, of the, osteo, um, of, 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 um, of the bone formation when, uh, when kids mature and they, became, they, they, they come inside the bone. And the question is, are they chondrosarcomas or are they enchondromas that you can watch? This is with them in the hands. In the hands, they're often lytic actually, and you don't often see the cartilage um, um, stippling, but tumors in the hand are very often benign. They're very, very rarely malignant. So you can be re relatively re reassured about um, hand tumors. So this is how you decide whether you've got a chondrosarcoma or an enchondroma. And it can be a little bit tricky. And this is where you useful to get your advice of your local oncologist um, to sort of, uh, or, uh, to give you that idea. So you can see here, this is a little bit more extensive, this stippling in the distal femur here. And there's also intermittent lytic areas and if you, there's also some endosteal scalloping here and the patient would probably have some pain at rest as well. And this is quite clearly a change and this is going to become a, a chondrosarcoma as compared to, let's just go back to here, there's no endosteal scalloping. This is just looking like uh, yeah, a, a cartilage tumor and this is still an enchondroma. So uh, how do you sort of tell the difference they're just my little table to try and give you an idea. You tend to sort of, um, yeah, just have to weigh up all the evidence. 
you get a clinical history, you look at the cross-sectional imaging, you also maybe look at the bone scan, and you do have to sort of make a judgment call on how, where, how far the evidence forms into becoming potentially being a low-grade chondrosarcoma and enchondroma. Low-grade chondrosarcomas you'd want to treat with a curatage, enchondromas, you don't treat, but you probably want to watch them and get another MRI scan in six months just to make sure there's been no change. If there has been a change, they become low grade chondrosarcomas and you need to treat with a curatage. Um, radiologists or your local tumor center can often help here. This is a condition of multiple enchondromatosis. And again, a nice question that you get asked in the MCQs. It's called Ollier's disease. It's non-hereditary, frequently affects one side of the body, often causes growth disturbance. And the key thing is that this has got a 25% risk of malignancy. So this is a much more um, sinister um, condition and you do need to follow these patients up. Um, so when they've got multiple enchondromas, that's significant and should be referred to the oncology unit. Um, this is a patient who'd had multiple um, enchondromatosis he had some changes now in his proximal humerus. We saw that there's significant cartilage here. So this had changed into a chondrosarcoma. And you can see there's cartilage tumor almost all the way down the humerus, um, very close to the elbow joint. So the only way that we can get a full clearance here was to give him a uh, total humeral replacement. And uh, he's been followed up for some cartilage tumors that he's got in his wrist and hand as well that you can probably see a little bit on his bone scan here. So we're watching him closely. He is part of, uh, of regular surveillance. There's another type of uh, form of multiple enchondromatosis, which also has hemangiomas in the soft tissues. And again, it's nicely favored by examiners. That's called Mifuchi syndrome. And here you've got 100% risk of malignancy in these patients. It's very rare no genetic background, but yeah, you often have to be quite prophylactic in treating these patients um, because the, um, uh, the, the, the risk malignancy is very high. Then coming on to another X-ray that often gives you almost like a pathognomonic um, clue as to what this tumor is. This is called a shark bite out of the proximal tibia. And if you see this, this is a classic site for another type of cartilage tumor called a chondromyxoid fibroma, which again is a slightly more aggressive cartilage tumor, but still benign, similar demographics that we've seen previously. And it's like this shark or rat bite out of the proximal tibia. So anything in here, it's often classically this. And that could look like a tangential osteosarcoma. So this is where you have to have a differential. It could be a chondromyxoid fibroma, but you would also talk about fibrous dysplasia and infection if you saw an X-ray like this. So this is where you've got to describe the X-ray, come up with some di differential diagnosis, um, and but try and rank them in the order of likelihood. Um, you don't want to go straight in with um, maybe fibrous dysplasia here. You'd want to probably have chondromyxoid fibroma as your number one. Treatment is often curatage, and again, the similar sort of recurrence rates with curatage. Then you've got the chondroblastoma, which we talked about right at the start of the talk about the epiphyseal tumors. And we talked about them being one of the few tumors in this. And the only thing that sometimes can recreate it is a, chondro is a clear cell chondrosarcoma, just to be careful. Again, these benign tumors are often treated with curatage and bone graft. So again, apophysis is an epiphyseal equivalent. And so you could have a tumor here in the left scranter, again, very similar, it would be like to be a chondroblastoma. And the talus bone is also an epiphyseal equivalent. And so if you've got a lesion in the talus, that's often a chondroblastoma as well. Then we're coming on to the fibrous type tumors now. We've done bone, cartilage, fibrous. This is called fibrous dysplasia, and you can see so that actually yeah, can actually be used in quite a lot of your, your differential diagnosis when you have lytic tumors. And this is meant to have this glass, this ground glass matrix appearance. But on some of the quality x-rays, it's sometimes difficult to sometimes appreciate that. Um, so if I was to say it is very common, not hereditary, often seen in the femur, tibia, can also be seen in the upper limb. 
and can be polyostotic when it affects just one side of the body. Um, we only treat it if it's symptomatic. Largely, it can be left alone. If you just correct fibrous dysplasia, fibrous tissue will come back. So the only way you can really turn fibrous tissue into bone is to do um, can, is to do proper bone grafting with structural allograft or structural autograft. And so if you've got a lesion in the neck of the femur, you may want to bring a fibular graft into it to stop it becoming that shepherd crook deformity that you see. So here we put a fibular graft up that was vascularized and that does luckily then turn fully to bone. If you just curetted this and put some more slide bone graft in, that bone graft would be taken away and you get fibrous dysplasia back within a year. Within a year. So um, yeah, you can only really use structural allograft in fibrous dysplasia. Again, a nice one for the MCQ is McCune Albright syndrome, which is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia with cafe au lait spots, precocious puberty, accelerated body growth and premature fusion of growth plates. So um, you, you know, and the, and the other, so that's an important sort of thing that sometimes you need to just need to know some of the stigmata and some of the signs of this. And then we're now coming on from bone cartilage fibrous to the cysts, the miscellaneous group. And again, it's this idea that um, yeah, you can see that could be fibrous dysplasia potentially. So you might want to bring that differential. It could be infection, but it's a lytic lesion at the end of the bone it's more metaphysis epiphysis so the other option is it could be a giant cell tumor or an aneurysm bone cyst you get an mri scan and you nicely see fluid levels and that gives you a lot of reassurance this is now an aneurysmal bone cyst where the giant cell tumor would be solid so an annual bone system cyst is again relatively rare young patient presents with pain quite an eccentric lesion and can be expansile. We sometimes see ABCs primarily, or we see ABCs around a, another sarcoma. So when you look at the MRI scan, you've got to, go, you've got to look and make sure there isn't a solid tumor um, um, being hidden beneath the aneurysmal bone cyst, because that's the bit that near them will need to be biopsied. So it can be an ABC on its own, or it can be secondary to another tumor. Like if it's on its own, you would just again treat ABCs with curatage and bone grafts. Just to really again reiterate that you've always got to be thinking, is this a malignancy? And the telangiectic tectatic osteosarcoma, i.e. the osteosarcoma that doesn't produce bone, is often a mimic of aneurysmal bone cyst. And you don't want to treat an annual bone cyst without a biopsy, just in case it's this. Um, as this can be a, obviously a very different treatment. So you've got to be always mindful of that benign malignant spectrum, I'm afraid. This is a unicameral bone cyst. And the classic thing about this on x-ray is you get the falling leaf sign, which is a flake, a flake of bone that's within the cystic um, milieu of this cyst. It sort of works away from the growth plate as the, uh, as the bone enlarges. In the upper limb, you can often leave this un, un, alone. Occasionally they fracture, they often heal up, and within a few years they stabilize. In the lower limb, unicameral bone cysts often do need immediate stabilization because you don't want them to fracture. Um, occasionally they've been treated with steroid, but my recommendation if you do have upper limb unicameral bone cysts is mask the inactivity. Don't touch them occasionally stabilize the lower limb ones. I, this is being talked about doing injections of steroid, but we don't bother when we see them in, uh, in Oxford. So occasionally you might need to stabilize the lower limb one. And then the giant cell tumor, which actually is a, probably a different beast. You've got to be a bit more aggressive with this probably. It does have a slightly hard chance of coming back to bite you with recurrences. The classic thing of a giant cell tumor is that it's a metaphyseal tumor that goes into the epiphysis. So it's never gonna be mistaken really for a chondroblastoma, which is often purely epiphyseal. So it, we, ask, we do see it in expendable bones. Um, you can do an on-block resection, but largely you treat with, with curatage. And I just wanna sort of show you how you curate these lesions because the curatage is very important. 
you you can just window it but on this case i'm just going to sort of show you we take the tumor out with the knife we do a full um um curatage taking anything that we can see out and send it off for histology this is a curetting spoon we often get the assistant to have a go as well then i inject the cavity with methylene blue and then we come in with a burr and we take all that methylene blue from out from in the cavity to make sure we burr every single area of the cavity, hopefully doing a good curatage and removing any tumor cells. And then we want to use a adjuvant just to try and kill any tumor cells still. We use a mixture of phenol or hydrogen peroxide. And finally, we often put cement into the cavity, which heats up and kills tumor cells as well. And that is probably the best way of doing a curatage, but still has a 10 to 20% chance of recurrence. And if it recurs, you might need to then think of an on block resection. That's the histology slides with a giant cell tumor. Luckily, I don't think you see too many tumor slides um, in the exam, but that's a quite a classic one of a giant cell tumor. This is the expendable um, bone, the fibula, and the giant cell tumor likes to go to the proximal fibula. Here you would actually just probably do an on block resection, being very careful of the, of the nerve as it wraps around the neck here. So that's a, a bit of a trawl through the benign. Now we're going to finishing on the malignant tumors. These are the three major malignant tumors, the osteosarcoma, the bone, the Ewing sarcoma, the miscellaneous, and the chondrosarcoma, the cartilage, and the fibrosarcoma, um, I'll probably just, just miss out because these are the three commonest ones, and these are their incidences in the population. Key thing is you, osteosarcoma and Ewing's are young people's diseases, whereas the chondrosarcoma affects the middle aged and elderly. There's a little peak of osteosarcoma in the elderly where well, that's due to Paget's. So Ewing sarcoma loves the pelvis. Chondrosarcomas love the pelvis. Osteosarcomas love the knee. That's what you take home from the, the incidence of their location on their, when they present. They, they tend to, Ewing's likes the diaphysis, Osteosarcoma, chondrosarcomas, they like the metaphysis. So osteosarcoma is a bone forming tumor. Most are called central. Occasionally 10% are surface. So the intramedullary or classic osteosarcoma is a high grade lesion where some of the surface osteosarcomas are a bit more low grade. They still need good surgery, but they don't need to have chemotherapy. When you have a classic osteosarcoma, majority of them are a 2B presentation, which means they have burst out of the bone, but they haven't got chest metastasis. You'll know more about the classifications and staging of sarcoma tomorrow. The key thing to think about when you're dealing with osteosarcoma or Ewing's is it's a systemic disease with just an orthopedic manifestation at the tumor site. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a key treatment. Neoadjuvant means the first thing the patient gets is chemotherapy. They then have about three cycles of quite toxic chemotherapy. Then they get restaged and then they have the surgery. And after surgery, they have more post-optive chemotherapy up to about six to 10 cycles, really depending on what the kill rate of the tumor is done by, by assessing the tumor resection that is taken out. How we do surgery, um, Tom will talk about this tomorrow, we often do wide margins on malignant tumors, balancing up preservation of limb with risk of lo local recurrence, with often some quite complex reconstructions. So central osteosarcomas do sometimes, you get the out phosphatase rays, they like the distal femur and proximal tibia and primarily. It's a bone producing tumor, which can be permitted because it's very disordered. So you often have a mixed lytic bone picture. Can you see that x-ray? You don't know where that tumor ends or where it finishes. So you, the, the bone is being destroyed here and you've got some lytic areas and some bone forming areas. And that's what you should describe in the, meta it's going from the metaphysis into the epiphysis. And this is the MRI scan. This needs a tumor prosthesis in the reconstruction. And the thing about this is you need to reconstruct the extensor mechanism. 
and how we ex how we do proximal tibial resurrections is we always use a gastrocnemius flap. That gastrocnemius flap covers the tumor prosthesis and reduces the infection risk, but also it can help stabilize the extensor mechanism reconstruction. So after about three months of keeping the knee still and stiff, they can then start flexing with no extensor lag. And bend it. And that's the type of thing you try and do by bringing a gastrocnemius to protect your proximal tibias. And that's what so you hope is a good result. I've mentioned this, uh, this wee beastie a few times, the telangiectatic osteosarcoma. It's a, a bit of a nuisance because it doesn't form bone, it's lytic. And um, you have to be mindful of this when you see other tumors like giant cell tubers and ABCs and even sometimes fibrous dysplasia. So just remember this, it's not a bone forming tumor, it's osteolytic blood filled sponge, I'm afraid. Luckily, not a common osteosarcoma, but you can see how you could maybe describe this as a benign tumor like fibrous dysplasia or a, a big unicameral bone cyst, couldn't you? Or, but actually, that's why it needed a biopsy and then a biopsy would have shown a very blood filled lesion with tumor cells within it. And that needed treatment like any osteosarcoma with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, surgical resection and post-operative chemotherapy. Then you have surface osteosarcomas, the periosteal and that pathognomonic x-ray I showed earlier, the parosteal, both the surface tend to be lower grade tumors, so they might not need chemotherapy, but still often need wide local excisions in their surgery. So just, to, yeah, just make your own table up of the differences between the periosteal and the parosteal, because there are some differences about where they come from. But really, I've not really ever seen a periosteal in any other place apart from the distal femur. So if you get a distal femur, uh, a, po a posterior tumor coming around, um, looking like bone forming, it's probably going to be a parosteal, and that tends to be low grade, but you still do a distal femoral resection to get a wide resection. So that's a periosteal. I don't think I've seen one anywhere else. I've seen periosteals elsewhere, but periosteals, that's a periosteal one. Bone forming surface on the surface of the tumor coming from the periosteum. Um, and that actually was a bit high grade, so that actually was given chemotherapy. The classic teaching. Um, on this is that um, your chemotherapy is the big difference in your survival and we're now getting up to about 70% five-year survival with chemotherapy when when we didn't really appreciate it was systemic disease we were only getting about 20%. We're very active with anyone with pulmonary disease we resect them and we've got a about eight or nine patients discussed on our tumor board every every week all being referred to the cardiac surgeons for for metastectomies. We are very aggressive and that really does help with patients with advanced disease. But the adjuvant treatment is important. Um, I don't think you need to know a lot about chemotherapy apart from that it's neoadjuvant, it's quite toxic, um, it affects your fertility, it affects your hair, but it's a key thing to get that five-year survival up. If you just operate, they'll have a, only a 20% five-year survival. So I'll just move on and just to show maybe sort of what chemotherapy can do. This was a Ewing's that had chemotherapy, it shrunk down, but the tumor cells could still be in this tissue around the fibula. So we wouldn't just do a fibrillectomy here, we would still go and take all the muscle around where the tumor was before. Because even though the chemotherapy had been affected, we don't think chemotherapy kills 100% of the tumor cells. It's a good result when we get up to about 90%. So you can see from this graph, over the years, we've had increasing survival with our osteosarcomas and Ewing's, largely because we're treating them with um, chemotherapy, allowing us to do uh, tumor prosthesis and limb salvage. Whereas in the old days, we were doing lots of amputations. So I think we are looking more and more at the molecular problems that are occurring in, in our sarcomas. We're really understanding the molecular disorders that occurs. And these are where the new biological therapies are being targeted. The trouble about a number of our sarcomas is that some of the genetic abnormalities are quite extensive. Osteosarcoma has multiple genetic abnormalities and so it's not at the moment 
very um, sensitive to uh, biological treatments. But this is where the future of treating sarcoma is being undertaken. So I'm just going to move on a little bit to um, just finishing on with chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma is um, malignant cartilaginous differentiation. It's uh, that cartilage, that, that calcified um, matrix. You've got various different grades of chondrosarcoma from one, two, and three, low grade, intermediate grade, high grade. And even within a tumor, you can have different types of grade. All of them can only really be treated with surgery. And uh, unfortunately, as you get more aggressive, the chance of you um, actually dying from the disease becomes higher. So a uh, low grade has got a 90% five year survival, a high grade 29%, but de-differentiated, which is a very aggressive type of cartilage tumor has got less than 10% chance. Just to, com just, to, just, just to highlight that a primary chondrosarcoma arise in normal bone, but secondary chondrosarcomas arise from those benign tumors that I've talked about earlier, such as an enchondroma or an osteochondroma. And uh, I'll just sort of show that cartilage stippling here. This is a pelvic tumor, and you can see that popcorn type appearances. This isn't a bone forming tumor. This has got calcification in it, little rings and arcs, and this is cartilage tumor. This is an enormous cartilage tumor arising from the ileal blade in a 41 year old male. Here we have to do a very joint preserving osteotomy, resection through the SI joint, and that allowed us to, uh, to get this out. And these are the, just the various types of pelvic resection you sometimes have to do. Type one is just taking out the ileum, type two is taking out the, the acetabulum, type three is taking out the pubis or ischium, Obviously, this is the one that's a challenge to reconstruct. Big tumor, we've brought all the abductor muscles down, and that's the tumor here that we're gonna do an osteotomy just above the hip joint. The only way this patient can be treated is surgery, so we've got to get the margin. So this margin is absolutely imperative that it doesn't go through tumor. Um, luckily, we did. We kept a bit of the hip joint. We um, were able to span the gap between the sacrum and the hip joint with a free fibula graft, which the plastic surgeons raised for us. They plumbed that in, we put that in to give the gate the guy his pelvic ring back. And you can see after taking all that out, that fibula graft nicely hypertrophied up over the next year and gave him intact pelvic ring. He was a bit weak with his abductors, but um, he's tumor free and didn't get any recurrence. So I'm just gonna just sort of yeah, finish off if I can, just talking about um, yeah, Ewing's. So Ewing's is the final one. It's that miscellaneous one. It's a small round cell tumor of unknown origin. It's a little bit distinguished that um, yeah, it doesn't quite fit into anyone's classification, but it often presents systemically. It's got a diaphyseal location often, and it's managed with like osteosarcoma with chemotherapy. Um, if you do have expendable bones, they can be excised. Um, if it's like a, a, a pelvic bone, you sometimes just treat with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, the treatment survival with chemotherapy is similar to osteosarcoma, about 60 to 70 percent. Um, if you don't give chemotherapy, the, the, the outcome is very poor. So this is a, a poor girl who had this lytic lesion in the femur that looks maybe could be fibrous dysplasia, could be infection, looks a bit irregular for a cyst, but if you get the MRI scan, you can see there's tumor permeating all the way down the femur. She had systemic symptoms, if I remember. This was the Ewing's. Um, she ended up with a total femoral replacement. Because these tumors often occur in the young, the children, you maybe have to think about, can this tumor grow? to allow the, the leg to maintain the same side as the other leg. And so we often use things called extendable endoprosthesis. This is where the implant can actually grow as a child grows. In the old days, you used to just have to come into theater and put a screwdriver in to yank out the implant. There was a high infection rate with that. So now in tumor surgery, we now use non-invasive growing implants. This is a magnet that the patient goes in every month 
and every month they can be lengthened just a few millimeters by going into this electromagnetic field, which means you don't have to come into theater, you don't have any risk of infection. And because Ewing's is the predominant pediatric um, um, condition we treat, we're often treating them with non-invasive growing implants. So I'm conscious I've just slightly gone over my time. Um, I'm happy to stay on and do the MCQs. So this is where I'm gonna stop. I've tried to give you a flavor of the classification to try and give a framework on which you can get a bit more detail into. Bone tumors are common, but there's a spectrum. And just using that description of the X-ray can often give you that stepwise assessment. Think about age, site, and matrix. What's a tumor doing to bone? Or what's a bone doing to the tumor? And always consult your local tumor center and always be ready to talk about that in the exam, I think. So in, in general, sarcoma is a rare, it's early detection referral, treatment requires an extensive MDT, lots of different types, subtypes, lots of site-specific surgery required. Oncological and reconstruction are the twin surgical aims and your adjuvant treatment is dependent on the type and grade of the tumor. So I just ask you, even in your, not just your exam, in your clinical practice, be alert, Always assess your patients. No shortcuts here in sarcoma. Work them up like as Tom will describe tomorrow. And when you do see these patients, always have the right tools for the job. And we're always here for advice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Whitwell. That's an excellent talk um, and quite an important topic for the FRCS. There's always going to be one legion on the FRCS exam. On the virus section. Um, we'll move straight on to the MCQs uh, and then from there we'll uh, answer any questions after that. If Hannah you could kindly share the poll. Thank you very much. Okay so the poll has started guys if you don't mind to answer it's completely anonymous we won't know who's answered what but it gives us an idea of how you guys are doing and uh, what areas of knowledge uh, we are uh, imparting on you and if it's working or not. Um, Mr. Whitwell will go through the questions at the end. In the meantime, just a reminder to everybody, uh, ORUK is a charity organization involved in research and education for orth orthopedic conditions, including uh, arthritis and uh, other conditions. Um, their website is oruk.org. Um, they have quite a number of educational uh, activities going on. The most recent one is going to be on the uh, 20th of October, Tuesday evening, uh, fiber practice session for foot and ankle. The FRCS Mentor uh, site is uh, frcsmentor.co.uk. Again, it's another uh, charity of uh, orthopedic surgeons who've uh, passed the exam and are passionate about teaching. Um, again, we have a number of viva courses. Please do uh, take advantage of going to that site to re register for those courses, as well as our usual webinars every Wednesday. And everything, all lectures are recorded and put on to our YouTube channel, as well as on the RUK website. Um, uh, we also published a book that you can see just over at my shoulder, Concise Orthopedics uh, Notes. It is, a, we believe, is a good solution for preparing for the FR, a revision notes for the FRCS. But we want to remind you that all proceeds go to maintaining the Zoom channel and the, uh, and our website. Uh, essentially, everything's plowed back into making sure that we can provide a better service each time. Okay, we're at two minutes, I think, and 77%. Uh, the quicker, if you guys can answer, that would be great. So we can maximize the answer. We'll close the polls in a minute. Nikki, I know you've been taking notes of all the questions for later. Thank you. And thank you to all our mentors today who are uh, supporting without their help in administration today. Uh, the, these sessions are very difficult to run. And I apologize today, we are just not, uh, we don't have enough hours in our week to be able to provide the mentors for a viva session today. Okay, we're at 80%. I think we should close the poll soon.
Okay, Mr. Whitworth, um, can you see the results of the poll? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I think, uh, yeah, look, just quickly looking, it looks like uh, most people were listening, which is good. And um, probably most people knew these because I try to highlight what I know the examiners like. Um, yeah, and I think the first one is which of the following disorders most commonly place a patient at risk for malignancy? Um, I largely talked about all these. I think I didn't talk about neurofibromatosis. Um, and that really is quite low. That, um, that, that doesn't really, um, that, that does have some risk, but very low. And I, I did emphasize quite quite strongly the 100% for Mifuchi. That's uh, multiple enchondromatosis with hemangiomas. Very rare, but that's rare in clinical practice, a bit more common in the exam. Um, McCune Albright, that's got a small risk. We, we talked about that. Ollie is 25%, Mifuchi up to 100%. HME, yeah, the exam, the, as I said, the books change about 0.2% for every osteochondroma. So looking at number, question number two, what current chemotherapy regimens? Again, I try to sort of give you a bit of a structure. The three major malignant bone tumors, Ewing's osteosarcoma, they're treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. You then do the surgery, you look at the histological kill rate, and then you put them back on, um, on chemotherapy for another six to 10 cycles after that. Chondrosarcoma, only surgery really no sensitivity to radiation or chemotherapy. So yeah, it quite clearly that, um, yeah, I think you got that right, that it's, um, it's, it's uh, chondrosarcoma that, um, so sorry, so I'm, I'm actually looking at question three. So do apologize. I'm talking about chemotherapy shown to improve survival for all of the following malignancies, except on um, question number three, it's chondrosarcoma, as I think I sort of emphasized. Osteosarcoma, Ewing's, lymphoma, rhabdo. I didn't mention those last two, but chemotherapy is vital. And then just going back to question number two, because I'm, so I'm sorry, I'm not, I haven't got all the, um, I haven't got all the, the screen. I think that's the one where we talked about with current chemotherapy regimens, what are the typical five-year survival rate? I think if you didn't do chemotherapy, it's 20%. I think you do well if you get up to 70% with your chemotherapy and osteosarcoma. And that's for patients with non-metastatic disease. It obviously goes down significantly if you do have metastatic disease. So you, everyone, um, most people got that answer right as well. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Well, um, we have had 220 uh, participants on our uh, uh, session today. Um, and quite a few questions. Uh, excellent talk, and it, uh, obviously by the questions it's been uh, coming up, it's been it's a topic which is burning hot in the minds of the guys who are preparing for the exam. Uh, Nikki, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so the first question is from uh, Mohammed El Gawadi. It's a bit of a staged question. Um, what if we know before nailing the femur that it was a pathological fracture as a result of a renal deposit? Would that change the decision? And then what after, um, if we nail it, if it then went on to a non-union, is it indicated to radically excise and replace? Yeah, I think in an hour to cover metastatic disease in all its depth, as well as sarcoma as a tall order, but it, it needs to be talked about because it does overlap and it is so important. And I think it's changing. It really is with these new biological therapies and the elderly population, we are facing a big onslaught of metastatic disease. Um, kidney cancer does not respond very well to radiation. It's got a number of new biological therapies. And actually there is a feeling that you can maybe cure solitary renal cancer to bone. So if we had known that was a pathological fracture second to renal cancer, and it was his only deposit in the skeleton, absolutely, he would have had a wide resection. But in that case, it probably would have been a proximal femoral replacement. Why it had to become a total femur was that the nail had pushed all the tumor down into the distal femur. It was all infected. And so that's why we had to be aggressive with a distal femur. So that's my, um, so I think that we should have not nailed it. It should have been biopsied. It should have been kept in traction. There should have been an MRI scan, a bone scan, a CT chest, abdo, pelvis. And then it would have been clear what the problem was and we would have recommended a proximal femur 
and then a secondary um, nephrectomy once uh, one, um, a, a few a few weeks after the the, the, the proximal femoral replacement. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from <clears throat> Maksud Khan. Um, if there's a past history of cancer but no meds and the cancer is known to be in remission, but the patient presents with a long bone fracture which looks suspicious, should we do local and systemic staging first before attempting to fix? Absolutely. Well picked up. I think you've got it because, yeah, you're in a busy trauma uh, meeting and maybe some corners are being cut. But when you're coming to the exam, you're not in a busy trauma meeting. You're trying to do best practice to show you're a safe and considered consultant. So if there's any idea that this maybe could be a primary malignant bone tumour, you have to do yeah, all the appropriate staging, keep the patient in traction if necessary, MRI scan, workup, and metastatic disease. I would only go straight to theatre if the patient had known metastatic skeletal disease. So if you've got someone who's got a good history or has got an MRI scan with multiple metastatic disease, then you probably could go straight to theatre. But if you don't have that, it's a primary malignant bone tumour until proven otherwise, and it's beholden on you to keep the patient in bed or whatever and, and do the investigations. And you can get the investigations done reasonably quickly on the whole. And uh, so, I, and definitely for the exam, if there's any question, um, you do that. So it's important. If there is known skeletal metastasis from a cancer, then you can go straight to theatre. Unless you've got that, which I think is your scenario of a previous cancer, um, that is, to me, that still could be a primary ligand bone tumour. Does that make sense? Yep. I hope that's good. That answered your question. Um, so the next question is from Motaz al Um How can I differentiate between enchondroma and bone island? Um, it's a radiological thing. It's um, yeah, it's, it's your matrix really. I think that once you get an MRI scan, you'll clearly see that the enchondroma has got a cartilage matrix. A bone island won't. It will be, um, and uh, the, the radiologist can easily tell you the difference. Um, on an X-ray, yeah, it might be a bit harder for you to tell, but an MRI scan will be the key, the key investigation. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Ali Abdul Hamid. What are the worrisome signs of enchondromas? Yeah, it, it, again, it's, that does take quite a lot of explaining. <laughs> um, and it's that spectrum, isn't it, between enchondromas and low-grade chondrosarcomas. And it, it's not an easy one. There's not an exact answer. As I try to explain, you've got to just look at all the evidence and uh, largely maybe talking to your local oncology unit, yeah, come down. Where I get worried about enchondromas is they've expanded. So sequential imaging has shown a change. Looking at the matrix, there's a bit more lysis around the cartilage um, component than normal. There's endosteal scalloping. The patient actually experiences pain in the, in the area. And the bone scan is maybe a bit, is, is very active rather than just being a little bit lukewarm that enchondromas tend to. And you tend to balance all that evidence up to decide whether you should do a curatage. But if you think it's an enchondroma, I would still recommend that you get sequential imaging and you recommend that another scan is done in six months time, just so you can make sure that there's no change. Thank you. Um, the next question, two people have asked the same question. I've got AJ oh, Cherezia and Mohammed Habid, Hamdi Abdel Hamid have both asked, What's the difference between a warm and a hot scan? Um, I think it'll just how, it, how it's reported. I think when you do a PET scan, um, which is, uh, as Tom will tell to you tomorrow, which is our major investigation now for systemic staging, um, the PET scan will actually give you an SUV, which is the activity of the tumor, the, the, the amount of sort of, um, yeah, um, 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 glucose, radiated glucose that's deposited. And that gives you actual value. Um, yeah, I'm afraid it's much more subjective with bone scans and it largely is dependent on the, the radiology reporting. There isn't a scale that they can really assess. It's a bit gray rather than black on the, on the scan, etc. But they'll talk about lukewarm, tepid. They will give you an idea 
whether it's bright or whether it is that that again that really doesn't help me mu that much it gives a bit of evidence when you're looking at enchondromas and no-grade chondrosarcomas but it's not the, the, the essential evidence but PET scans are much better now at giving us a, an actual figure. Thank you. Uh, we've got Imran Ali who said um, is Morel score for pathological fractures valid for paediatric cases or do we have another similar scoring system to guide your treatment decision? Um, I mean, that's an interesting question. I must admit, Mirrells, yeah, it probably is the one to use for the exam. Um, I, think, I think it is still quite valid. Um, yeah, again, Mirrells is largely due to metastatic disease, isn't it? And that's very uncommon in paediatrics. So yeah, I don't know a paediatric specific one be quite honest. I think if you do have a pathological fracture, I think you do need to get, often get a biopsy or you need to look at the imaging very closely. Um, but no, there isn't, if the, quest, the answer to your question is there isn't a specific paediatric one that I know of. I, I don't think that minerals is more for metastatic disease, as you said. Mm. I don't believe there is anything paediatric at all. So we do use murals to a degree, but yeah, um, I, I, it, it does help. Um, so I think that's still very valid for the exam to under, have an understanding of murals, which again, I haven't had time to describe, but it's quite easy to understand if you read the books. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got Cameron Hafiz, who's asked, are monostotic fibrous dysplasia and non ossifying fibroma the same? No, no, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are different. A non ossifying fibroma is really is the very um, unaggressive tumour. You'd almost call it latent. It doesn't do anything at all. Um, it very rarely causes pain. It's got a big corticated margin around it. So you know that the bone is really warded off and uh, it's very different from fibrous dysplasia, which is this ground glass appearance um, without, and the bone doesn't show any evidence that it's warded off. So it's, it, they're, they're, they are different pathologies. Fibrous dysplasia and also fibroma, you'd largely um, just observe anyway. You wouldn't actually treat. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got Awes Sheikh, um, who's asked, do you use cement on a GCT even in a young patient? Very good question. I think that's uh, another, a little controversial area. Um, I like cement. I think it's a very good adjuvant. It heats up, it gives structure. And that heating up really does lies any remaining tumour cells. So, um, but still we get 10 to 20% um, risk of recurrence. I think a paediatric um, patient has obviously got some bone growth still to do. Yeah, that could, um, could, could potentially affect it. So yeah, we do in paediatric cases, do largely just put bone graft in. Thanks. Um, we've got Amra Abula. How do we differentiate telangiectasic osteosarcoma from mimicking bone, benign tumours? How you do that is to educate all orthopaedic surgeons to be mindful about it and to make sure that they work the patients up properly with the scans and they get a biopsy. Um, and you've got to have it at the front of your cortex and not have it at the back of your cortex and you don't think about it. So. Yeah, the biopsy unfortunately is so vital. So we see benign tumours and we're saying we think they're benign, but we'll probably get a biopsy just to be sure. And that really can only happen in a tumour unit. So these cases get referred up. So think about that um, because you can always get caught out. And we see examples of that happening, unfortunately, quite regularly. So um, it's not um, just something to scare you. It still happens regularly that telangiectasic osteosarcoma is a missed, I'm afraid. Mr. Whitwell, in, would any uh, radiological investigations help, including uh, bone scans and or MRI in these situations? Not particularly. Bone scans could still be quite active. Um, um, an MRI scan would, um, yeah, we, that you might see a bit more pimps on an MRI scan than an X-ray, but yeah, the biopsy is the critical thing there. Okay, I think we've just got two more. So Harry Benjamin Lang has said, for isolated renal cell metastases, how soon after ablation can you operate and what is the window? Oh yeah, good question. So renal cell, again, is the subject all on its own because kidney cancers are very vascular and uh, we've had some frightening days in theatre treating uh, kidney cancers intralesionally. And so, yeah, you tend to, well, you always have to recommend that if you're going to go intralesion into a kidney metastasis, you've got to embolize it first of all. 
And how we embolize it is with our interventional radiologists. And we tend to do, try and do that within three days of the operation. Um, so yeah, 72 hours is the recommendation. Yeah, I'd probably, if the worst comes to the worst and, and, we, and we've missed that, I would be happy to go up to about a week. But after about a week, new vessels will be growing into that tumor. And so it could be a bit more vascular than, uh, than, it, than you'd like it. Still be prepared when you're treating a renal cell. The classic teaching, the classic example is in the pelvis. It's eroded the hip joint. You're trying to put a um, hip replacement in. The classic thing is that um, it could still bleed a lot. So even though you've embolized it, it could still you know, be a bit challenging. So I get lots of adrenaline soaked gauze swabs. And if it does bleed, just pack it with adrenaline soaked gauze swabs. And that can often staunch the, the blood flow quite significantly, allowing you to sort of carry on. So that's a, a little tip if you do ever encounter quite brisk bleeding from some of these metastases. Thank you. Um, then we've got Suleiman Yunus. He said, in a case of Ewing sarcoma, or in, maybe it's in your case of the Ewing sarcoma, Elliot Wing, would you recommend chemotherapy after resection and pasteurization? Um, yeah, that's a really nice point. So, yeah, what's interesting about treating sarcomas, if you go around the world, there are lots of different ways of doing it. Um, some people use literate nitrogen um, to, 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 to inside lesions which get curated, etc. And there's some funny sort of treatments out there. What um, that question's alluding to is the fact that you can take bone, um, which is affected by a tumour, away at the time of surgery and you can take it out of the body and you can go and treat that cancer with some other type of adjuvant and then in the same operation you can put it back in and you just basically plate it back in and then hopefully with creeping substitution that that that, that, that the fracture will heal and you'll have the the the, the, the tumor treated but the patient's own bone back in and the pelvis is a classic situation for this i've had experience of irradiation so it's called extracorporeal irradiation where the pelvis is taken out, it's given high dose radiation that otherwise could not be given to the patient with the bone in because it would be too toxic to the running tissues. The tumor's killed and then you put that, that bone back in like a bone graft. Another option is pasteurization, which you can put it into liquid nitrogen or, or things like that. So there are those techniques around. I don't do it in Oxford at the moment because um, it's quite logistically challenging to do. But it, yeah, it is well recognized as treatments for these conditions. So um, yeah, he, do, he does talk about some ways that some units do treat their, um, their, their, Ewing's, their, Ewing, their Ewing's sarcomas. Okay, thank you. Um, Mohammed Nail, uh, this is like an exam question. Would you advise to do a biopsy in a DGH or better by a tumor unit? I think, I, think that, <laughs> I think, again, Tom will talk about this tomorrow because there is classic teaching on how you do a biopsy. The key thing about a biopsy is it should be excised at definitive surgery. The biopsy tract should be excised because potentially the needle or the operation has led some tumour seeding along that biopsy tract. So if you're not going to do the definitive surgery, how do you know where the biopsy will be? So we do recommend that any tumor gets biopsied in the tumor unit, and then we can direct our radiologists or we can do the surgery with the biopsy tract in mind for our definitive surgery. So any tumor specimen we take out often has the biopsy tract attached to it. Okay, Nikki, um, I know this is, this, this is a really hot topic. I really know that a lot of people are, you know, got a lot of questions. But to be honest with you, a lot of these questions are now getting to the high level. And I know Mr. Uh, Whitwell has gone way over the time that he had allocated to us. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the time you've given us, Mr. Whitwell. Um, those, the, question, the rest of those questions are pretty much um, beyond the scope of the FRCS exam. Um, in fact, some of those questions were already beyond. Thank you very much for answering them. No problem. Um, the, and thank you for your patience. Really amazing talk. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Well over 220 uh, participants uh, watch this and I'm sure we'll get a lot more uh, hits on the different uh, uh, platforms that we're going to be putting this up on. Once again, guys, next, tomorrow, uh, Prof. Costa, uh, sorry, uh, Prof. Costa will uh, be here to discuss 
how to investigate and manage uh, these patients in the and especially in metastatic disease as well. Um, to everyone, thank you so much for attending. We are, uh, as always, uh, here every Wednesday, um, except tomorrow, which will be Thursday. And look forward to seeing you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Best of luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if um, we can stop recording now, and uh, if.